Madhouse, Chapter 8. After everyone had stuffed themselves with hoagies and chips from the cooler in the lobby, Christine went upstairs to change back into the clothes she was wearing earlier. It was really dark upstairs except for the little lanterns that were scattered about. Shadows danced across the dark, suffocating walls. Christine thought about how Eddie had complimented her. If he hadn't had a girlfriend, she'd have thought he was coming on to her. In the little room, Christine peeled off the black dress and laid it on the cot. Just as she was about to put on her t-shirt, she heard footsteps moving down the dark corridor outside. Suddenly, the door swung open and Christine jumped. She instinctively covered her half-naked body with the shirt. Who's there? she yelled. The door was now wide open and she couldn't see who was out there in the blackness. But she could feel a pair of eyes staring at her. Who's there? she screamed. Her question was only answered by heavy, raspy breathing that could be heard just outside the open door. Chills ran down Christine's spine. Close the door, she demanded, staring into the darkness. She saw a flash of shadowed movement and heard the heavy footsteps move away. Christine knew that whoever was out there had seen her undressed, and that made her feel angry and violated. She slammed the door shut and finished getting dressed. Christine walked downstairs shakily, determined to find out who had been up there spying on her. Everyone was sitting around in a circle on the floor eating the last of the food. Christine whispered to Julie, Did anyone just come downstairs? Only you, Julie answered. We all just finished eating. Why? Someone was up there, Christine gulped. Someone just opened the door while I was changing my clothes and they were staring at me. They saw me in my underwear. Are you sure? Julie asked. But no one left. I'm pretty sure of that. Eddie butted in after eavesdropping on their conversation. Someone opened the doors upstairs just now? He asked, his eyes wide in surprise. Yeah, Christine said. Everyone was staring at her. Eddie grabbed his handheld camera and pulled Christine up by the hand. Come on, it must have been the ghost. He looked at the rest of the crew who were sitting there in astonishment. Okay, everyone, he commanded. Split up into teams and take your assigned positions around the hospital. Make sure that your walkie-talkies are on. Howard, Jason, you go hook up the generator for the mounted cameras and lights. Hurry! Eddie bounced up the stairs and Christine followed. In there, she pointed. That's where it happened. Eddie picked up the lantern and searched the small room where he found nothing unusual. He entered the hallway and began pushing on the boarded up doors. Still, he found nothing. Eddie finally leaned against the wall and searched Christine's face. Are you sure you saw something? She corrected him. I didn't see anything, but I heard footsteps and the door opened. I could hear someone breathing. Eddie sighed heavily. Maybe he'll come back later. The thought made Christine shiver. Yeah, do you think it could have been the ghost? It's the only logical explanation, Eddie stated. Everyone except you was downstairs eating. It didn't sound very logical to Christine, but there seemed to be no other explanation. Christine sank down next to Eddie, and he put his hand on her knee. Are you okay, Christine? Yeah, thanks, she said, looking at his hand in surprise. He removed it quickly. Sorry, I didn't mean to touch you like that. Christine secretly wished that he had meant it. So now what do we do, she asked. We wait, Eddie said as he set his camera on the ground. We wait until the ghost comes back. Isn't making films fun, he joked. Scary is more like it, she answered, but exciting. Are you always going to make ghost documentaries? No, Eddie sighed. I'm going to make movies. This is just a start. As soon as I sell this one, or at least show it around, I'm going to try to get work with the studio in Los Angeles. What about college? she asked. Don't you have to go to film school or something before you can get a job? Not from what I've read, Eddie said. All the great directors never went to film school. They just started making independent films until they got noticed. It's all about who you know, anyway. So when I move to L.A., I'll go out there and start meeting people and making connections. Christine sighed. It all sounds so far away, so Hollywood. It is far away, he told her, but I'm catching the first plane out there after I graduate next year. I've got my mind made up. Maggie suddenly appeared out of the darkness. The lantern light shone up in her face and looked like a scene out of a horror movie. Did you get anything on film? Did you find Christine's peeping Tom? She asked sarcastically. 
Christine knew that Maggie had been standing there listening to them for some time, so the answer was obviously no. No, Eddie said, but he'll be back. I can feel it. Maggie sat down very close to Eddie and smiled insincerely at Christine. Eddie scooted over to put a little distance between them. So what are you guys talking about? she asked. Nothing much, Eddie said and yawned. The silence was thick. No one knew what to say. It was obvious that Maggie was an unwanted third will. Hey, Mag, Eddie finally asked, would you go get me a soda from the cooler downstairs? Maggie knew she was being brushed off, but she smiled at him anyway. Sure, I'll be right back, Eddie added. Will you bring Christine something? He turned to look at her. What do you want? Bottled water would be great, Christine said. My lips are so dry. I'll bet they are, Maggie mumbled to herself as she disappeared down the hall. Sorry about Maggie. I think she's a little jealous of you, Eddie said. I guess she's got a right to be, Christine admitted, realizing that her comment might have come across the wrong way. Eddie raised his eyebrows quizzically. What's that supposed to mean? Christine explained. Well, after all, she is your girlfriend, and here you are sitting in the dark with a strange girl. I'd be upset, too, if I were her. Wait a minute, Eddie said in shock. You thought that Maggie and I were... Who told you that? Maggie, of course, Christine informed him. She said you two have been together for years. Eddie grimaced distastefully. No way. We've never been a couple, just friends. We hang out all the time. She's like one of the guys. You must have misunderstood her. Christine was beginning to see the truth. No, Eddie, she, she made it crystal clear. She winked at Eddie. Well, she really likes you, that's for sure. No wonder she's been so rude to me all day. Eddie laughed. I'm going to have to have a little talk with Mag later. Christine was relieved to discover that Eddie was single after all. So does this mean you're available? She asked jokingly. Eddie nodded enthusiastically. Yes, definitely yes. And you? Christine smiled shyly. Well, that depends on who's asking. I'm asking, he said. Christine crinkled her nose. In that case, yes. Brandon slumped against the wall in the east wing of the old hospital and hummed to himself as Julie scoped out the dark hallway. Brandon, Julie whispered, come here, look what I found. Brandon lifted himself up from the chilly tile floor to see what his girlfriend was so excited about. What? he moaned. Julie grabbed Brandon by the hand and led him into a tiny room that was just off to the side of the main hallway, where they had been posted. She ran her hand along the wall of the room and giggled. It's padded. We can have a lot of fun in here. Oh, yeah. You're right about that. He groaned pleasurably. He peeked out into the hall to make sure no one was hanging around. Julie giggled and wrapped her hands around his strong shoulders. She closed her eyes and gave him a long kiss. Brandon closed the door and peeled off his shirt. Stanley and Randy had been assigned roaming duty, which meant that they had to walk around the building to keep watch for anything out of the norm. The two boys ventured off into the east wing of the hospital, toward the padded cells. Julie suddenly sat up and Brandon groaned. "'What's the matter? Why'd you stop?' "'Shh!' she hissed, placing a finger on her lips. "'I think I hear someone coming.' Julie wrapped her shirt around herself and peeked out into the dark hallway. "'That's weird,' she mumbled. I could have sworn I heard something. She shrugged her bare shoulders and smiled at Brandon as she dropped the shirt to the floor. Now where were we? She growled playfully. Stanley and Randy stood frozen at the end of the hall. Randy stammered. Did you see that? Stanley shook his head and fumbled for his walkie-talkie. A ghost! Stanley went around the corner and ducked into the stairwell. He spoke into his radio. Eddie, come in! We just spotted something at the end of the east wing. Hurry! Eddie and Christine jumped as the radio crackled to life. Eddie grabbed his camera and pulled Christine by the hand. Come on, they've got something down there. A wave of fear and excitement rushed through Christine as they ran downstairs and into the dark east wing. They found Stanley and Randy cowering at the top of the stairs. Randy pointed a freckled hand at the doorway at the end of the hall. D down there, we just saw it. Eddie turned on his camera and miniature light as he made his way down the hall towards the door. Christine's heart was pumping furiously. Eddie whispered, One, two, three, and barged into the room. Julie and Brandon screamed. Brandon jumped to his feet. Ah! 
He shrieked, terrified by the surprise. Eddie and Christine screamed, which made Stanley and Randy scream. Julie angrily held her clothes against her body and yelled, What the hell are you guys doing? Are you crazy? Brandon, clad only in his underwear, shook a fist at Eddie, who quickly turned off the camera and went to the hallway. What's the matter with you? Brandon bellowed. Julie and Brandon quickly got dressed and came into the hallway. Eddie was angry now, too. What are you guys doing? What do you think we were doing? Brandon said. Eddie blushed. I know what you were doing, but you were supposed to be keeping watch, not sneaking off and scaring all of us half to death. Brandon pushed his flushed face right into Eddie's. We're out of here, man. I can't take this shit anymore. He grabbed Julie by the hand. We're leaving now. Christine and Julie gave each other helpless glances, and Brandon stomped down the hall. Within minutes, Julie had grabbed her bag, and she and Brandon burst out the front door of the hospital. I have never been so humiliated in my whole life, Julie said. You're telling me, Brandon yelled. I think they did that shit on purpose just to sneak a peek at a little live action. Julie was about to say something in their defense, because she knew that it was probably just a misunderstanding. But instead, she stopped dead in her tracks and gasped at what she saw. Brandon stopped, too, and his mouth hung open in shock. His heart pounded wildly. The tires of his silver VW Bug had been slashed and were nearly flat. All of them. The little car looked odd, sitting so close to the ground. No! No! Brandon screamed out of frustration. Just as Brandon was about to blame someone inside, he noticed that all the tires on all of the vehicles had been slashed to ribbons. Julie stammered. Oh my God, look! She was staring at the gates that surrounded the old building. Someone had locked the gates shut with a thick chain. They were all trapped inside. Julie pointed a shaky finger at the chained up gates. Oh my God! She cried. Who would do this? Brandon angrily kicked up a cloud of dust and cursed, looking at his car. God damn it! Julie peered around into the forest and grabbed Brandon by the arm. Come on, we've got to go inside. Brandon knew that they had to get out of there. Someone was after them. He had to think fast. Wait, he said. He opened the trunk of his car and removed a can of fix a flat. Oh, get real, Brandon, Julie shrieked. That's not going to even start to help the situation. Brandon snapped at Julie, not because he was angry with her, but because he was very afraid. Let me do it my way. I've got a spare in the back, and if I can just fix the other front tire, maybe we can get out of here. Julie sniffled. But the gates are locked. Even if you get the tires fixed, we're still trapped in here. You go and try to open the gates, and I'll fix the tires. Go! He shouted. Julie reluctantly walked over to the gates and began tugging on the heavy chain, which was secured with a padlock. She peered out into the forest surrounding the property and tried not to think about the noise she'd heard earlier out there. But the shifting shadows wouldn't let her thoughts cease. Was someone out there watching them? She suddenly became aware that the night noises of chirping insects and croaking frogs had stopped. It was strangely and disturbingly silent. Something was very, very wrong. Chapter 9 Maggie mumbled to herself angrily and went downstairs to the soda cooler. She'd seen Brandon and Julie run outside a few moments ago, but she didn't care. Maybe they'd leave and take their Barbie doll friend with them. Maggie toyed with the idea of spitting in the drink she'd been sent to get for Eddie and Christine. It figures Christine would want purified bottled fucking water, she muttered through clenched teeth, like she should be afraid of calories. Maggie knew that Eddie was only interested in a girl like Christine for her perfect looks. Looks that Maggie would never have in a billion years. She'd have to figure out a foolproof plan to get Eddie to hate Christine. Maybe she could make up a good lie to tell him about her or something. Maggie extracted a cola and a bottle of water from the cooler and opened them. Just as she was about to spit in them, she heard a noise down the hall. Quickly, she put the cap back on the water in case one of the guys saw what she was up to. Maggie listened for the noise, which had stopped. She sighed and walked back toward the stairs. One of the doors was open a smidge. As Maggie reached out to close it, a filthy hand suddenly grabbed onto her wrist. Maggie screamed and the drinks went flying out of her grasp. What the? Maggie's terrified cries were muffled by a rough hand that clamped over her mouth. She bit down, but that only made the attacker's grip tighten. She couldn't breathe. 
The figure spun around and spun her around, and she gasped at the horrifying figure when she saw him. Patches of clumped, matted hair sprouted out of the thing's misshapen head, and a pair of crazed eyes burned into her from behind a blood-splattered plastic mask. Its huge body was covered in a tattered mud-cake jumpsuit that revealed bits of pasty white skin with hideous scars. Through her state of total shock, she realized that it was Michael Myers, the boogeyman. Maggie screamed and wavered unsteadily, her face pale with fear. Before she could struggle, Michael Myers threw her flailing body down onto a table and strapped her on. He stuffed a rag in her mouth so she couldn't make any more noise. Maggie watched in horror as Michael Myers ripped open a black box on the counter. She winced as he extracted several cords and metal lobes from the black box. He forced a rough plastic band around her skull and left the room. Maggie tried to scream, but could only manage muffled whimpers. As Christine and Eddie recovered from the scare and embarrassment of the false alarm, they made their way back down the hall toward their position. Eddie found a narrow corridor off the main hallway and stopped suddenly. Look at this, he whispered. Christine joined him and watched as Eddie pointed to a series of doors. He ran his hand along a tiny section of square glass embedded into one of them. What are these little windows for? Christine asked. Eddie gulped. Solitary confinement. But they're so small, Christine said, stepping into one of the tiny rooms. She ran her hand along the cold cement walls. How awful that must have been for the poor people locked in here. Eddie followed her, then closed the door and turned his flashlight on. The heavy wood door slammed shut with a sound of final authority. They couldn't hear anything but the sounds of their own breathing inside. Here, Eddie said, handing Christine his tiny video camera. Press the red button on top and get a shot of this. Christine took the camera, and a small light shone across the walls covered with cobwebs. She pointed the lens directly at Eddie. Eddie spoke, looking at her. Solitary confinement, he stated. Can you imagine the horror of being placed in here? Day after day, night after night. This is one of the many treatment programs that were executed by the late Dr. Blackwell, head of psychiatry. It's enough to make a sane person go insane. Christine shivered and Eddie motioned for her to turn off the camera. Suddenly, the whir of the generator downstairs groaned to a stop, which could be heard everywhere in the building except for the small cell. The dim light from the camera mounted down the hall snapped off. Christine set down the camera and took Eddie's hand in hers. Eddie flashed a smile at her. A wisp of her blonde hair fell across her face. All he could think about was the fact that they were all alone and she was holding his hand. He tried to avert his thoughts back to the documentary, but he couldn't. His hormones had taken over his brain, and he could only think about how Christine had looked in that tight dress earlier how she'd seemed so happy to find out that he was single. He looked into her jade-colored eyes, which seemed to be calling out to him. Eddie followed his instincts and kissed her. Christine returned the kiss and grinned up at him. "'What's the matter? What's so funny?' he asked quizzically. "'I was hoping you'd do that sooner or later,' Christine said breathlessly. Eddie wrapped his arms around her slender waist and kissed her again. Chapter 10 when the generator snapped off, Stanley and Randy scattered like cockroaches to gather the lanterns. Randy didn't like being in the dark, especially not here in this creepy old building. He always slept with the nightlight at home. The two boys stumbled up the stairs looking for Eddie. They had just left him up there a few minutes earlier. What do you think happened? Why did the power go off? Randy questioned nervously. Stanley snapped. How am I supposed to know, dork? Let's just find Eddie. He'll know what happened. W where did they go? Randy wondered, staring down a dark, empty hallway. They were right up here a little while ago. Maybe they went downstairs, Stanley shrugged. Randy's voice cracked as he called. Eddie, Christine, you guys up here? Suddenly, a hollow bumping noise came from down the narrow corridor. They finally followed the sound and saw that it was coming from behind a door. The two boys froze in their tracks, trying to make out the sound. They both stared at each other for a moment. Stanley whispered nervously and pointed at a closed door. It's coming from in there. Randy's eyes were wide with fear. We should call Eddie on the radio. 
What? And make fools out of ourselves again? Stanley cackled. I don't think so. He tugged at Randy's shirt. Come on, we'll check it out first. Stanley crept up the tiny glass window on the other side of the door and peeked inside. At first, his eyes were wide, but then he began giggling and waved Randy over. He whispered, It's not a ghost in there. It's better. Randy timidly approached the door. He guessed it couldn't be anything bad if Stanley was laughing. Stanley was pretty serious most of the time. Randy peeked inside the room where he saw Eddie and Christine making out. Wow, he said in awe. Looks like Eddie's going for it in there with the blonde chick, Stanley whispered excitedly. He's so lucky. Christine Ray is such a babe, Randy sighed enviously. Next summer, I'm going to make my own documentary. Apparently, girls like directors. I'll invite the entire cheerleading squad, and they'll be crawling all over me. In your dreams, Stanley cackled, pushing him out of the way. His breath had begun to fog up the glass. Randy looked away from the tiny glass window, feeling a pang of guilt. We shouldn't be spying on them. Eddie would kill us if he ever found out. Nonsense, Stanley giggled. This is great. Our own live peep show. You need to get a life. And maybe after you finish getting through puberty, then you can talk about peep shows. Besides, we need to tell him about the generator, Randy said. What they're doing in there is generating enough electricity to light up an entire city, Stanley giggled. If we can only figure out how to harness such unbridled power, he joked. Randy's eyes opened wide. What? What are they doing now? Step aside, Stanley told him, swatting Randy away from the little window. I found it first, so I get to watch. Randy tried to peek over his shoulder to catch a glimpse. Come on, man, let me see. Just as Stanley was about to tell Randy to take a walk, a set of heavy, slow footsteps became audible in the black hallway. The boys looked at each other blankly and stood there in stunned silence. The footsteps stopped. Who's there? Stanley whispered meekly. Randy's stomach tightened as he shone his flashlight down the dark, narrow corridor. A hair-raising growl came from somewhere in the darkness. Stanley gulped heavily. I said, who's there? Stanley fidgeted nervously. The dead silence was really bothering him. Who was out there? Why weren't they answering? Suddenly, Randy was hit from behind. His body crumpled to the ground in a flash of jolting pain. He shook his throbbing head and screamed when he opened his eyes and saw what was looking over him. Oh my God! A face, a horrifying face, stared down from behind a withered plastic mask. The scar-puckered skin on the thing's hands and neck was almost glowing in the dim light. Randy opened his mouth to scream again, and his voice was cut off by a worn steel-toed boot that crushed into his jaw. Stanley was in shock. When his brain finally sent the signal to his legs to run, Michael Myers had already grabbed him by the neck. With a vicious growl, Michael Myers slammed Stanley's head into the hard cement wall, cracking his glasses. Stanley felt his body relax as a trickle of blood filled his right eye from a gash in his forehead. The pain faded as the blackness closed in around his eyes. The walkie-talkie fell out of his hand and clattered to the floor. Michael Myers dragged their limp bodies down the hall and into another room with a sign marked Operating Room. The door slammed shut. Chapter 11 Julie's hands were covered with black grease and dirt from the oily chains that was hopelessly wound around the iron gates. She ran back over to Brandon, who was cursing as the flat tire solvent oozed right out of the tire into a white puddle on the ground. I can't get the gates open, she said, panicking. We're stuck in here. Brandon forced himself to think logically. The tires were shot beyond repair. Okay, he said gently, trying to ease her hysteria. Let's just go back inside. The moonlight silhouetted the monstrous building against the black sky. It looked even more threatening than before. Brandon didn't want to go back in there, but he didn't want to stay outside either. He grabbed a paper bag from the back seat of the car. I've got a little surprise in here that's sure to lift your spirits, since we're stuck here and all. Julie cocked her head to the side, looking at the bag. What? What's in there? she asked. Brandon grinned crookedly. Booze, what else? he replied, leading Julie through the main doors of the hospital. Her dark eyes flashed, and she smiled mischievously at her babe boyfriend. You're on, she said. How come it's so dark in here? Julie whispered nervously. 
Looks like the power went off, Brandon said. Come on, let's go find everyone. The couple made their way through the dark lobby and found a heavy door into the back wing of the hospital. This isn't the way, Julie hissed as they stepped through the doorway. Yes, it is, he argued. We were just in here. The heavy door slammed shut behind them. Brandon reached for the handle, but there wasn't one. The door had locked itself from the outside. What's wrong? Julie panicked, watching Brandon push and then throw his body up against the door. It must have locked from the outside, he said and gulped. He pointed down a dark, unfamiliar hallway. We'll go down there and find our way back around, he decided. Julie squinted into the darkness. The only light source was the moon, which shone through a dirt-caked window that was almost entirely boarded up. No, Brandon, I'm not going in there, she declared. Do you have a better idea? He growled sarcastically. We can't go back the way we came in, obviously. Fine, Julie said and gulped weakly. She followed Brandon down the dusty corridor. Julie pushed on every door, but they were all sealed up with boards. At the end of the corridor, Brandon came across a pitch-black stairwell. Let's try upstairs, he said, hoping that his voice didn't sound as shaky as his legs felt. Julie latched onto Brandon's arm as they carefully climbed the dark stairs one at a time. On the second floor, the couple found more boarded-up doors in another dark hallway. After unsuccessfully searching for a link to the other side of the hospital or a way out, Brandon flopped onto an old worn couch. We'll just wait here, he said, not knowing what else to do. Julie sighed heavily and plopped down next to him. Great. This is just great. Well, who's the one who just had to come here tonight? He said with a hint of blame in his voice. Anger flashed in Julie's eyes. Don't get me started, Brandon. This is not the time or the place to start arguing. You're right, he said. It was my fault for opening the wrong door. Maybe someone will come looking for us. I hope so, Julie said. She looked into Brandon's eyes, which seemed to be smiling, and she felt a little better. Brandon pulled a bottle of wine from the paper bag he was carrying. We might as well enjoy ourselves, he suggested with a sly, crooked grin on his lips. Julie grabbed the bottle and managed to get it open. She took a gulp of the red liquid. Cheers, she said. At least we're in this together. Okay, this has been chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 of Halloween the Madhouse. And I gotta say, for young adult novels... The Scream Factory and this book are actually pretty daggum good. You know, and the book's really getting getting good right now. Who else is glad that Maggie was Michael's first victim? I can't be the only person. Anyways, let me know in the comment section what you thought of tonight's chapters, what you think of the story, and what you think of the story going forward from here. And I'll be back very soon with some more of Halloween, The Madhouse. Till the, until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening and... I'll see you next time.